Esther, joining us online, we're welcome, we're glad you're here. We're in a series called Talk About It When. And this is so much more than just a series on parenting. Uh, we've been making this statement that if I would ask everyone in this room if we should have a kids ministry, everyone in this room would probably say, yes, we should. But what does that mean? What does that look like? And my history and my background have led me to really kind of wrestle with this over the last 12 months. And as you all know, it led me to my mom who for 35 years uh, did an in-home daycare. And it was so much more than that. It was loving the kids, loving the parents, um, teaching them, feeding them, protecting them, but most importantly, making sure they know that there's a God in heaven who loves them, who wants to have a relationship with them. And I said, that's what I want to do. So no matter where you're at, if you're uh, with kids that are under 18, or if your kids are grown, or if you've never had kids, this is an important lesson for you to learn and, and, and the value of the ministry. And so to kind of set this up for you, we've been learning a verse. It's going to be on the screen behind me, Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5. This is called the Shema. This is what Jesus said was the most important thing when they said, what's the most important commandment? This is where Jesus went to. And we've been saying this just because we want to memorize God's word. We've been learning it. Hopefully some of you have done that. We've also been doing some kind of fun little actions with it to kind of get in, get in the, the kids mode. So uh, let's go ahead and say this together. If you feel brave enough, you can do the actions with me. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul, and with all your strength. Good job, guys. That's great. So we're learning that too. And again, this is the foundation, not just for parenting, but for life. And the next passage says when you talk about it, when you're at home, when you're on the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. It's not just Sunday morning. It's not just Wednesday night. It's every day becoming who you want to be in Christ. And next week, we're going to wrap up this series. And the conclusion I'm going to share, it's one of the biggest ideas when it comes to parenting. So I hope you come and make it. Um, but if you haven't been here, we're going to kind of catch you up. You can go to our website, our YouTube channel. Um, the first week, we talked about encouraging and how we need, uh, kids need our presence, they need our touch, and they need our words. The best gift you can give a child is your undivided attention. Every kid, we need to have physical touch. And our words matter. What we say to our kids matter. And last week, we talked about discipline. And we had so much fun with discipline, I said, I can't even get it all into one week, so we have to split it up. So part one, I taught you a verse, Hebrews 12, 11. It's going to be on the screen behind us. Let's read this out loud together. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. No discipline seems pleasant. Definitely to the receiver, but also to the giver. If you enjoy discipline, I think there's something wrong with you. That's not, we shouldn't enjoy it, but it has a purpose. Later on, maybe not in that moment, but it will produce a harvest of righteousness and peace. But the key is for those who will be trained by it. We live in a world that has not been trained by discipline, at least not by God's word. And we need to be that if we want to raise up the next generation. And there's a word that we talked about last week called wise how we all want to be wise. We all think we're wise. Our spouse would say otherwise. We have a desire for our kids to be wise. But in addition to being wise, there's three other places that kids can be or we all can be at. The first one is they can be simple. When a child is simple, we need to help them understand how. There's a reason why they're kids. They just simply don't know what they don't know. There's not enough life experience, not enough cognitive development. We need to help them with that. And if a child is having trouble and it's not your kid, this is where we always start. We always start, maybe they just don't know. Maybe they've never been in the situation. We don't know that kid. Let's teach them how. But if they are your kid and you know that they know, then we go to their being foolish. How do we overcome foolishness? We help them understand why. We set an expectation and we follow through, even if it's difficult. Now, if it's not your child, at this point, you need to involve the parent. That's their God-given appointed relationship. And we want to build a relationship not only with the kid, but also with the parent. But there's a third spot. When they know, when they understand, they're just being willfully disobedient. And by the way, we've all been there with kids and with ourselves. We need to help them understand who. And this is right where we left off last week. It's because of who we are. And I made the statement, I said, how many of you have ever heard the phrase, because I said so, <laughs> right? And how many of you actually said that as, you, as a child, right? It's a better phrase. Not because I said so, but because of who I am. 
and because of who God is. And so with that, I want you to turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 3. If you don't have a Bible, let us know. We'd love to get you one. We also have YouVersion. It's a free app you can download. Um, but this is kind of the beginning of part two of this. And I set this up for you last week by saying, we're going to look at the greatest behavior correction of all time. This is the goat of all behavior corrections, Genesis chapter 3. But to set it up, we're going to look at Genesis 2, verse 16. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. God created a paradise for man and woman. There was perfection and harmony with God and with each other and with nature. Notice the pattern here. God's treating them as simple. They just don't know. God helped them understand. You can eat any tree. I made this whole world. You can eat any tree you want. But this one tree right here, you need to stay away from because it's trouble. He set an expectation. If you do this, then this will happen. If this, then that. God set a clear expectation to which some people have argued, and I think rightfully so. Why would God do that? Why wouldn't he just make everything perfect? Why would he put something there? Did he do that to set them up? Was he trying to make them fail? And I think the reason why God did that is because the greatest gift God has given us is also the greatest gift that we as parents can give our kids. He gave us the gift of choice. God has the authority and the power just to make us puppets and to do whatever, we com whatever he commands. God is not interested in our compliance. God is interested in our love and our choice to make that. See, love always gives a choice. It makes a decision to say, I'm going to do that not because you told me to, but because of who you are. You created me, you know me, and you love me. That is why God did that. And Adam and Eve faithfully followed what God said all the way to the end of chapter 2. <laughs> and then chapter 3 comes along. And this is traditionally called the fall of God. Now, I've said this before, but, but I believe it. People will say, how old were Adam and Eve? Did, did God create Adam and Eve like were they babies? Did they grow up into people? Or did they just come out like fully grown? I don't know the answer to that. The Bible doesn't say that. But I, I do have a question. What age were they when they decided, you know what, we're going to do this, the fall of man? When did that happen? I'm pretty sure, I can't confirm this, but I'm pretty sure they are about 14 years old. Because <laughs> there's something about the human brain at that age that just goes, I don't know. I know what I've been taught. I know what you've said. I know you've taken care of me. But really, do you really know, God, what matters? And they start questioning that. Look at verse 6. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eyes... And also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some of it and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it too. So they saw that it was good for food. There was a physical desire there. It was pleasing to the eye. There was a visual desire. But more than all of that, it was the desire to gain wisdom. That I might know more than God. And again, as kids, sometimes we think we know more than our parents. This is exactly what's happening. Now, before we move on, I want to make a clear point. Eve has always gotten a bad rap. This passage has been used to oppress women for thousands of years, and we need to unpack it for a second, because look at what the Bible says. She gave some to her husband who was with her. The language is pretty clear here. Adam stood there the entire time, knew exactly what Eve was doing, but said and did nothing to that. He knew exactly what the consequences were, but he was with her the entire time. So he was an active participant in what was going on here. Look at verse 7. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. This is the classic case of a kid that knows that they've messed up. Like, oh no, I just did it. I got in trouble. I've got to try to fix it and cover it up. I broke mom's vase. I'm going to glue it back together again before she notices that it's, that it's broken, right? I'm going to fix it. Everything's going to be okay. True story. Um, when I was uh, in high school, um, I had a, a basement. I, I lived in the basement of our house. We ha Actually, it used to be an apartment before we lived there, so I had like a bedroom and a full living room. So needless to say, my place was a place to hang out. How many of you know when you get a bunch of teenage boys together in, in a small space, bad things can happen, okay, right? So I don't know exactly how it happened, but at some point, the couch that was down there, one of the legs broke off of the couch. I'm pretty sure it was because one of my buddies like suplexed his friend into that one or something like that. I don't know, right? So my solution was I was going to take this broken leg. I was going to take all the legs off the couch, right? So then the couch is, you know, it's all level, no problem. 
It worked just fine until uh, one day, a couple, probably weeks later, my dad came downstairs and he went to sit on the couch. This is exactly what it looked like. He went to sit down like this and he went, <laughs> he's like, are the legs off the couch? I go, yeah, I, I just took them off. <laughs> we do that as kids, don't we? We try to cover up. When we know we've screwed up, we know we've done it, we try to cover it up. Look at verse 8. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. They hid from the Lord God among the trees in the garden. Quick, Dad's coming. we got to hide. We're going to be in trouble. We're going to miss. He doesn't want him to find out. And all of humanity has been running from God ever since that moment. We try to find our way. See, guilt and shame are very real emotions. I would argue guilt and shame are God-given emotions. When we do something that we know is wrong and goes against God, we should be convicted of that. Now, we shouldn't stay there. God doesn't want us to stay there, but that is a real thing. We need to be convicted of our sin. All of humanity has been running from God ever since this moment. But look what God does. Verse 9. But the Lord God called to man, where are you? This is not God didn't know where they were. God knew exactly where they were. The problem is Adam and Eve didn't know where they were. And from this moment forward, God has pursued every man, woman, and child ever since. All of us have been now born into sin because of Adam and Eve. And God says, listen, where are you? I want to chase you. I want to find where you are. Look at verse 10. Adam answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. Verse 11. And God said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? Watch the pattern here. God knew they didn't know. He helped them understand how. Now it's shifted. He knows that they know. Now they've made a decision. Also notice how God asks questions. I think one of the problems as parents is we make statements way too often. We need to be more curious. We need to ask questions. Did God ask the question because he didn't know the answer? No, God knew exactly the answer. Are there times as a parent you know exactly what happened? <laughs> and aren't those the moments that you want to just jump right in and say, what are you thinking? What are you doing? Notice God doesn't do that. God asks questions. You know why? Because God doesn't, God's purpose, listen, God's purpose is not compliance. God's purpose is relationship. He wants to teach us how to think and how to live. So Genesis 3.12, the man says, yes, I have eaten from the tree. I accept full responsibility for my actions. I will accept my deserved consequences. But please don't hold the woman responsible for it, it was all my fault. And that's not what God's word said. I just made that part up. <laughs> That's what we think would happen, right? But listen, we laugh, but we expect kids to do this, don't we? When they're caught red-handed, what do they do? They lie. They hide. They're ashamed. They're embarrassed. Or they do what Adam did. Look at what actually verse 12 says. The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Even though Adam knew it was wrong, he was with her, he did nothing about it, and he refused to accept responsibility for his action. And can I add, all of humanity, we've been blaming each other ever since that day. Well, it's because they did this, or because they did this to me, or, or I was just doing what they said, and we've been blaming, and we've been blaming ever since. See, we start off as simple, we don't know, we help them understand how, but right now they're being foolish. And when someone is being foolish, we have to help them understand why. This is where we said last week, you move from a conversation to a consequence. In verses 14 through 19, God walks through a consequence. And the first thing that happens is Adam turns to Eve and says, it's Eve. God, listen, God doesn't go, I know it's you, Adam. I'm going to take care of you. God turns to Eve and says, Eve, what happened? What does Eve do? She turns and says, it was the snake's fault. So God goes to the snake, and he starts with the snake. And then he moves to Eve, and then he moves back to Adam. And he says, these are your consequences for your actions. God is helping them understand who he is. Listen, I am the one who created you. I know what's best for you. I love you. I need you to follow these rules. And since you didn't, 
Now there's consequences for your actions. And every single person since that time has been born under the same curse of that. And at this point, listen, God looked at his precious creation. He saw them exposed. He saw them ashamed. They were scared and they were helpless. Verse 7 tells us that Adam and Eve tried to sew some fig leaves together, try to make it work. It must have looked really pathetic to God. <laughs> like, what are you trying to do? What are you trying to fix this? Verse 21 is one of the most precious verses in the entire Bible. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife, and he clothed them. I don't want you to miss this moment. God saw Adam and Eve in their helpless, naked state, knew that they were ashamed of what they'd done, knew they had been caught red-handed, handed the consequences, but he wanted to help them learn who he was and to protect them. If you remember, at the beginning, the snake had said to Eve, you surely won't die. They heard that if they took the tree and ate it, they would die immediately. And guess what? It didn't happen, did it? They didn't die immediately. They're still alive. Keep in mind, they didn't know what death was. Everything was perfect. There wasn't anything. And God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife. Where do you think he got the skin from? God had to take an animal. It might have been a goat. might have been a sheep. He brought him over and he said, listen, you guys don't understand what just happened. And he took that, and the very, listen, the very first animal sacrifice ever made was God for the sins of Adam and Eve. And he took this, can you imagine what that was for them? When they saw him do that, and they're like, what is that? What does that mean? See, this is what happens now. Now there's a consequence. And God took that, not to kill them, but to put the skin and put the covering around them to cover them. Listen, this is why when God established the nation of Israel, what did he establish? The sacrifice of animals. Why? Because he wanted to remind them who he was. I am God and you are not. Every time you go against me, every time you do something on your own stubborn self-will, it causes sin to come into your life. And the redemption of that is that we have to sacrifice that. And the death is part of that. And that stayed all the way through until Jesus. It's not just actual clothing, but it's the love and the covering of God. Why? Because of who God is. God created every single man, woman, and child. He knows everything about you. He loves you with an undying love. And out of humanity's defiance came this great gift of love, came the grace from God. And oh, by the way, came the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and the hope of redemption and eternal life that we can have. We don't understand who our God is and how much he loves us and what he did for us. So, if you're a parent, I'm going to give you three things. What does this mean? How do we apply this? Looking at what God has done in this situation, there's three things we need to do. Here's the first one. Discipline means give choices. The greatest gift God ever gave to humans is the gift of choice. Can we agree? Nobody likes to be told what to do. Even as adults, we don't like it. See, you have to give people a choice. That's what God did. God gave us a choice. But here's the important part. As a parent, you get to control the choices. Here's just how it used to work in our household. We'd say to our boys, would you like to eat your peas or would you like to eat your carrots? You can decide which one you do, right? I'm giving you a choice. These are the options. Which one do you decide? Instead of making statements, give choices. See, what we're teaching our kids is how to learn, not just comply. We're not teaching our kids just to comply. We're teaching them to learn and to think and get creative. Find out what motivates your kids. Find out what they like. Find out what they dislike. Can we agree? Even if our kids are grown and out of the house, we still need to help them understand. Giving them choices, not directives. If you call up your kids and you say, you should do this or you should do that, I guarantee you they tune you out if they haven't already. Give them choices. Help them understand. Discipline means give choices, just like God did. Here's number two. Discipline means stay consistent. Don't let them off the hook when they need to be held accountable. Now, it might seem easier in the moment. We don't want them to be mad at us. Nobody ever wants to be the bad guy, right? But we're only hurting them in the long run. And if you're here today and you have older kids like teenagers or adults, I learned this phrase and it was life-changing for me when, I, when my kids were teenagers. Don't bail, let them fail. I'm going to say that again. Don't bail, let them fail. It's easier said than done. See, God allowed Eve and Adam to eat the fruit. Do you realize that he could intervene at that moment? As soon as Eve was reaching for the fruit, oh, Eve, 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 what are you doing? Stop, stop, stop. Don't do that. Don't do that. Do you know what you're going to do? God didn't do that, did he? You know why? 
Because Eve had already made up her mind what she was going to do, and God knew that. God could have got her to comply in that moment. She would have stepped away from the tree. Five minutes later, she would have been right back over there again because she'd already made the decision. Don't bail, let them fail. We know sometimes life lessons are only learned the hard way. And it's one of the hardest things for parents to do is to watch their kids struggle and suffer, and God doesn't like it either. But if that's hard for you and you struggle with that, remember, you are running a marathon, not a sprint. It's really easy to get lost in the day-to-day and forget you are running a marathon, not a sprint. Parenting is a long-term goal. It's so important that we respond, not react. It's easy in the moment to react to what's going on, but we really need to take time and think what's going to be best. I want you to take a moment to think back on your childhood. For some of us, that was a long time ago. For some of us, it wasn't that long ago. But if you were to tell me, describe your childhood, I guarantee you, you could do it in probably three or four sentences. It probably starts something like this. Well, my mom, and then we describe that, or my dad, and you describe that, or whatever your house situation was, you would talk about that, four or five sentences. Okay, now that we're adults, we look back and we say that. Here's the challenge. If you have kids right now, look down the road a year, five, 10, 15 years from now. What do you want your kids to remember? What memories do you want them to form about you? Maybe they'll say things like, oh, yeah, I was pretty mad at them. <laughs> oh, yeah, they, they sure gave me consequences. They held me accountable, but I'm sure glad they did. And how about this one? I know that my parents loved and served Jesus. They weren't perfect. They didn't get it right. But, boy, did they love and serve Jesus. Can I tell you something? Elaine and I, we made a lot of mistakes as parents. I can guarantee you we made a ton of mistakes as parents. You know one thing that I'm really proud of? We made sure that our kids knew that there was a God who loved them. They made sure to know that church was a priority in our life. We didn't just show up on Sunday. We would stay and we would serve an extra service, which kind of took up some of their weekend, but we made sure that that was important. And oh, by the way, we got to a point where we said, people matter to Jesus Christ so much that we are going to sell our house, we're going to quit our jobs, we're going to move you from the only town you know, go to a town where we know nobody, because we want people to know that Jesus matters. Was that easy? No way. Did they struggle with that? You better believe they did. But I can sit here today and say I'm so glad that that's the legacy that I left for my kids. That's the consistency that we gave them, that their relationship with Jesus Christ matters. What do you want your kids to think about five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now? And again, if your kids are grown, it's not too late. (laughs) You can still start setting that precedence. Give choices. Stay consistent. But if you forget everything I say about this series, I want you to remember number three. Be prayerful. Be prayerful. Our kids may ignore our words. They may defy our rules. They may reject our beliefs. But understand, our kids are powerless against our prayers. Our kids are powerless against our prayers. So much of our job as parents is to make sure our kids are covered. And I mean like clothing, right? Some kids run around naked. You got to make sure they have clothes on, right? We need to make sure that they have food, that they have proper hygiene, that they go to school, that they put gas in their car, that they do their homework. How many times have we forgot to cover our kids in prayer? The most important thing we can cover our kids in. And if you're not praying for your kids, and this might hurt a little bit, I don't think you understand who God is. Let me help you with this. Think about how much you love your kids. Think about how much you have dreams and plans for your kids to be successful. Think about how much you desire for them to be healthy and caring people and just know that that's a fraction of how God feels about them. God is infinitely more concerned about how your kids turn out. Maybe we should include him on the conversation because he created them. He knows them. He loves them. He gave them to us as a gift that we can love and train and see that. We need to be in prayer on our knees every day for our kids. You see, the goal is not behavior management. The goal is life transformation. And what legacy are we leaving for kids? And next week, we are going to land this plane. And I hope you guys can be here because we're going to unpack what it means to really leave a legacy for your kids. But as we're wrapping up here today, um, I'm going to go to a time of prayer. And as I said before, I worry sometimes that we don't understand prayer because I don't think we know who God is. And so as I'm praying, what we're going to do, I'm going to be silent. 
We're going to play a little music in the background. And as I'm going to give you time in a moment, I want you to be in prayer. What I'd like you to do, if you have kids, I want you to pray by name for every one of your kids or grandkids. And as you're doing that, if you need to pause, if there's something you need to confess, if there's something that God puts on your heart, write that down. And before, listen, before the end of today, <laughs> maybe you need to reach out to them and tell them that. And make sure you do that. And make a commitment to God that you are going to pray for your kids. Because again, he cares about them so much more than you and I ever will. He loves them. He has a desire to be with them. Cover your kids in prayer. So again, I'm just going to pause here. I'm going to let you guys pray. And then I'll come up and close this in a moment. God, I know there's a lot of conversations going on right now. And God, I pray that, again, there wouldn't be any guilt or any shame or any regret. But right now in this moment, God, I pray that we would just continue to lift up those kids to you. They are a gift from you. And God, I pray that you would remind us to every day to cover our kids in prayer. God, I thank you for the wonderful model that you set with both Adam and Eve, and not just Adam and Eve, but everyone throughout Scripture and, and all the way down through every single one of us in our lives, God. You cared enough about us to give us a choice. You weren't interested in creating a bunch of robots that would worship you. You create, wanted to have a people who would love you and desire to be with you. God, you are so consistent. You do not change. You are the same God that was in the Garden of Eden, the same God that was with Moses, that was with Abraham, that was Isaac, Jacob, all the way down to Jesus, all the way down today to Yankton, South Dakota. God, you have been consistent with your word. And God, please give us the strength and the courage to know what that means in our own kids and our own lives. And God, I beg you that you would keep us on our knees in prayer. Again, that we would just ask for your wisdom, but we would continue to cover our kids. And if anything has been laid on our hearts today with our kids or with other kids, God, I just pray that you would bless that. I pray that you would honor that. God, if there's someone here today and maybe they don't have kids, I pray that you put a family on their heart. That, that maybe, maybe it's an, a niece or a nephew or maybe it's somebody in this congregation and they would just go up to them and say, you know what, I'm going to be praying for you. I'm going to be praying for you and I'm going to be praying for your kids every single day. God, I can't imagine what it would look like if we had a group of people that would be committed to that, that we're going to pray every single day. And God, I imagine one day when we get to heaven and everyone in this room is standing there with all the kids that we've been just praying for, all of our children to be there with us, God. And we have a moment where we said, on August 18th, 2024 in Yankton, South Dakota, we started committed to be praying for you every day. And you're here today because of that. God, I can't imagine what impact that's going to have on the next generation and for the, our culture and for our world. Thank you for that privilege. We ask all this in the matchless name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing a song. It's called 10,000 Reasons, and as we're singing it, let's continue to worship and pray for our kids. <laughs> 